Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good open be. question. Mm. Is to, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of work done on that whole PV uh, and geotropic instability stuff with the models, and very little done with the um, observations. Um, partly because we cannot generally calculate potential vorticity. So we can calculate the vorticity and do something with, like bare tropic, but then you know we really want to think about it um, from the potential vorticity perspective in terms of heating, you know, uh, heating in the eye wall and the PV breakdown. Um, it, it starts to get very complicated with the real observations. So um, in, interpreting that, you know, from solely from radar reflectivity, political eye walls or or satellite imagery to suggest. It, it certainly can be suggestive that there's instability, but then actually calculating, you know, like the growth rate of a wave number three or wave number four perturbation is quite difficult from the real observations. So, so I mean, there may be certain low order wave three, wave four type perturbations that are growing, but then are also being damped by the symmetric um, shear. shear and just symmetric vortex stretching or uh, PV generation. So certainly an interesting question. So in fact, uh, I guess one last point about that is you know, Patricia, there may be something like that going on too. Because, uh, I mentioned Patricia has an incredible um, rapid intensification rate, but it also has an incredible weakening rate. And we don't know exactly what happened with that weakening rate, whether that's barotropic <coughs> instability or vertical shear. I mean, some of it was due to land interaction ultimately, but I don't know exactly what happened with the, with that with Patricia either. So um, whether or not we can, you know, we'd have to simulate the storm quite well to, to, to make some of those comp claims. But I'm going to see what I can do from the observations. But it'll, be, it'll be challenging. Regarding the sure. I'd like to know your opinion about. There is a debate between Montgomery group and Kepa group uh, about the second level. Sure. <laughs> Kepa uh, Montgomery group says uh, super gradient initiative is okay, but uh, Kepa san says uh, just a contribute to the SV. Right. Um, <laughs> yes, that debate has not been settled. Um, my, my personal feeling is um, that they're both right, and to some degree, mm -hmm. um, that it's a matter of emphasis. Um, so I think it's a bit like the chicken and egg problem. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I, we certainly see evidence of super gradient wind yeah. in, in, the, in this. And in fact, I show some of that in this paper. Um, uh, and I have a student, um, Shannon McElhinney, who did her master's work where we um, actually retrieved the super gradient wind for this case. Um, and uh, we're working on that paper right now. But she took another job, so she's been, so she's working at GFDL now. Um, the, the challenge with the aircraft observations is, once again, that we can't sample it every time that we want. So a lot of that, the debate comes from the numerical model, where we can sample everything all the time. Um, but the numerical model, the magnitude of the super gradient wind depends very strongly on the parameterization used for the, for the planetary boundary wave. So um, part of Kepler and others' criticism is that they think that the super gradient magnet, wind magnitude is overestimated in some of the simulations that Mike Montgomery and Roger Smith have done. For example, with the slab boundary layer model, you get a very strong super gradient wind that's probably over overestimate of what's in reality. Um, my, my feeling is that um, it's a combination of those two things, so we need convection, and, and like uh, Ito-san's paper, you know, uh, his poster, which uh, we, we need convection to occur at that radius, and it's clear in this case that there will <coughs> be fine convection occurring in the primary rain band. Um, but then we also need dynamics to, to assist. Whether the super gradient wind is the initial um, thing or the convection is very difficult to distinguish. Yeah. So I think you need both. So um, I, I would argue that 
the, the basic idea of super gradient wind being a primary driver of the second, secondary eye wall is, is correct. I would also argue that feedbacks, so the Keppert idea is that you have feedback of convection and you have a vorticity enhancement out here, and that vorticity enhancement leads to Ekman pumping and leads to more convection, that's probably also correct. Um, and Jeff and Mike can argue about which one's more important, but I'd say both are important. I'll, I'll punt and, and say they're both important. Shimano-san, <laughs> maybe come to see my poster. <laughs> I have some, some opinion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think his, his results are, uh, would very, you say very it's consistent with that? Yes, yeah. right. That's the first step. Super gradient wind is the first component and to be needed. But after that, it, the super gradient wind gives some uh, static instability. It should be, you know, super gradient wind conveys a very high equivalent potential temperature, you know, in a, uh, this level. So it gives a very uh, good opportunity to develop, uh, you know, convective instability. So that makes the, you know, a second step. If the second step, in a second step, we, if we have much humidity in this area, you know, super gradient wind futilize the large, large you know, convection. So it forms the secondary eye formation. So two step processes. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. But uh, I think there is another condition. Uh, transition wind field expand outward right. before the right. mm -hmm. So I think also this is a uh, you know first step. Yeah. Yeah. And we do see evidence of that too here. That the, you know, the angular momentum is it's clear, you know, the, the vortex is clearly broadening prior to the development of the secondary eye wall. But but also we you know, we don't have all the observations we need. Um, I wish we could have flown it, you know, like when it was over Cuba or near Cuba. For example, we have another, even more data. But um, yeah. so in this case, yeah, you can definitely see that there is a uh, a dynamic enhancement of something with that flat tangential wind, which helps with the convection. Super gradient winds probably largely due to the angular momentum conservation, and then a favorable environment for convection. We have more moisture in the outer ray bands. So many different components that are important. Okay, any other questions about secondary eye walls before we go to asymmetric? Okay, well then let's talk about asymmetric. I did cover this some on Wednesday, so I'll go through some of this a little more quickly. Um, but I do wanna talk about how we've been able to make some nice advances with uh, about the asymmetric structure with uh, airborne Doppler radar. Um, so uh, I put, picked three studies here, Corbusero and Molinari, 2002. Uh, Kristen Corbusero was at SUNY Albany now. Um, well, she was at Albany before, but she's back at Albany now. Um, did some really classic work on looking at the uh, asymmetric structure as a result of wind shear. So in this case, the wind shear vector being, the once again, the difference between 850 and 200 millibar winds is the, um, the, the, the vector. And you can see that these dots each represent lightning. And so all, most of the lightning is in the down shear direction. Um, it, shear is a strong organizer of the convection. Um, and then, but then from the airborne Doppler radar, Reeser et al. did a composite of many, many storms reoriented to the shear vector. So the shear vector in the same direction here. The, the colors are radar reflectivity <coughs> and the contours are vertical motion. And so you can very clearly see the uh, wave number one uh, asymmetry in the uh, vertical motion with the strongest vertical motion down shear. Um, uh, downward motion up shear, and then, then the uh, radar reflectivity is maximized to the left of the shear vector, and that's because the convection is in initiating here, and then um, maximizing here, and then the hydrometeors are falling out over here. So um, the uh, convection is being forced down shear, but then the radar reflectivity shows up primarily left of shear due to uh, azimuthal advection of the hydrometeor. So, um, so that's an important point. Uh, and then uh, Jen DeHart uh, actually did a really nice study also looking at the same database um, where she looked at individual quadrants um, showing this initiation down to your right, um, maturation down to your left, um, and then um, you know, down, strong downdrafts in the up shear left, um, and then very weak motion in the up shear right quadrant. So um, uh, this structure, shows up over and over and over again. Um, 
So I, I want to talk about this uh, paper a little bit more. Um, this uh, paper that my PhD student worked on, and she's uh, finishing up her dissertation on the site, uh, looking at Hurricane Rita right now. Um, but Pat Vincent Lapu, so many of you probably remember this, and this was from Key Park. This is the uh, 85 gigahertz um, satellite image that shows, so in this case, the shear direction was from the southwest as uh, Tin Laku uh, passed by the Hawaii, uh, Japanese islands. And so all the convection was in the down shear direction here. Um, this, if we look at the, the life cycle of the storm, you can see it formed here just east of Luzon, uh, intensified to a, a strong uh, typhoon, uh, impacted Taiwan, and then began to recur. And then if you remember, I showed you Hagapit yesterday, the formation. Um, so formation time of uh, Hagapit was uh, September 18th. So that's here, okay? So we flew Hagapit on 14th and 15th. So right when Sinlaka was here. So Hagapit was coming across, the, the, the wave that became Hagapit was coming across over, um, over here. And um, we had to make the decision to uh, shift gears and decide to fly Sinlaku at this time. Uh, partly because the forecast tracks were taking it up here and undergoing extratropical transition. And that was one of the main goals of TPARC, was to capture the entire life cycle. So as much as we wanted to continue to fly Hagapit and get Genesis, we knew that if we didn't capture Sinlaku, that we would maybe not get another storm that was going to have this track. So, um, so we packed up the P3, and um, myself and several others, Wen Chao Li, um, and, uh, and several military personnel, um, flew to, um, so we actually flew several missions. Um, the first mission we flew um, on the 18th when the storm was, uh, so the, the models were forecasting it to um, decay and, and, and undergo an extra tropical transition, but in reality it decayed and then re-intensified to a typhoon, a tropical typhoon here, and then underwent extra tropical transition over here. So we were lucky because in one sense we got multiple missions out of it. So we flew it on the 18th when during this reintensification phase and uh, Beth Sanabia wrote a nice PhD dissertation about that phase. Um, and then we flew it uh, here um, uh, on the, the 19th. Um, so we flew to Kadena uh, and flew it from here. And then we went to Yokota and flew it um, three more times. Um, so there's a nice paper by uh, uh, C.P. Chang and colleagues uh, talking about the, uh, the this stage and then um, the next, so all four days have been analyzed in the literature now. Um, so I'm just going to talk about this one since I was a co-author on this paper um, and then uh, Julian Quenting's paper looking at extratropical transition. I won't talk about for time reasons, um, but he, he analyzed the extratropical transition stage. Um, so I did want to put this in context. Uh, so if we look at the, the storms that have been in, analyzed in detail that are undergoing significant vertical shear, uh, Jimena, Olivia, and Guillermo are the three big ones. Um, they were all in the deep tropics and all much stronger storms. Whereas Senlaku, West Pacific, 33 north and only 68 knots. So we wanted to know, one, what's the stru structure as it's approaching extratropical transition? Is it different? Um, and two, is it like these other sheared storms? The answer, by and large, is yes. Um, that it, the, the shear dynamics actually hold quite well, despite the fact that we're in a different basin, different latitude. Um, but then the weaker intensity uh, also helps to our advantage to see some more detail that we were not able to see with the stronger storm. So, um, so I'm just going to go through this uh, relatively quickly. If you have any questions, please stop me, and then we'll take a, a short break. Um, so this is the Eldora analysis from that time. So this is a, a one kilometer, five kilometer, and eight kilometer altitude radar reflectivity and storm relative winds. Um, and these are uh, analyzed by Samurai. So, um, and then this is the wind speed uh, at those different heights. And you can see the shear vector is overlaid here um, from this direction. So here's the hodograph uh, at this time. So this is meters per second here. So in fact, the, 850, the traditional shear metric is 850 to 200 hectopascals. By that definition, the shear is quite strong. It's about 30 knots or almost 15 meters per second. So very strong shear. 
Um, but you'll notice that when, by the time you get to eight kilometers here, that there's really no longer a, a fully closed circulation. So the circulation only goes to about eight or nine kilometers. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to use the 200. I mean, the shear is very strong here. But, so what we ended up using was the um, 900 to 400, uh, or 850 to 400 uh, hectopascal shear. So that's got a slightly different direction. You'll notice this arrow matches this arrow and not that arrow. And so, in fact, this shear is only about uh, 8 meters per second. So in this case, I think that's partly due to the fact that it's at 33 north. It's a farther north. It's a shallower system, um, slightly colder SSTs. Um, so uh, the, this met shear metric, I think, is a little more relevant. And you'll notice that the, the reflectivity, though, matches our conceptual model of shear of uh, down shear left and left of shear maximum in the reflectivity. But you'll notice that as you go higher uh, in the storm, that that uh, reflectivity maximum actually shifts down shear. So it, it rotates from here to here, right? Um, and so if we look at it in three dimensions, we see, uh, so this is that same, that piece here is that, that piece, uh, that this strongest convection is in fact in the down shear direction, but then a lot of the hydrometeors that are being generated here in this deep convection are actually falling out over here, right, as they fall out down, down shear. But this has still got some quite strong convective elements. Um, it's sort of a mix, but you'll see, um, I, I can't remember exactly, I think this is a 35 dBZ contour and a 40 dBZ contour. Um, but uh, the, the strongest stuff is definitely here. There's uh, still a few strong elements over here. Almost nothing over in this quadrant whatsoever. Um, interestingly, the wind speed is the strongest over uh, here, and we're still not quite exactly sure what, why that is the case, uh, what, what's causing that um, strong uh, enhancement of the wind here. Um, but you can see that as you go higher and higher, because the flow is so strong out of the southwest, it basically cancels out the uh, return flow in the other direction. So if we put this in context from some other uh, airborne radar studies, um, we see that it matches this uh, conceptual model quite well and matches that reser and all composite um, with the strongest reflectivity left of shear. So in this case, the shear vector in this plot is left to right. Um, so you see initiation of updrafts, down shear, um, advection around the eye, um, and then primarily downdrafts on this side. And then he talks about the exhaust anvil you can kind of see a little bit up, up here as well. Okay. And then um, the, the other thing that I, I want to point out from this one, which I, I did mention the other day, is this idea about convective to stratiform, and that we see in this case a very strong convection really transitioning to stratiform uh, precipitation as we go down shear. So this is a, another schematic from Anthony Didlake and House talking about the primary rain band. I already showed you the one from Henson House, right? Uh, that also shows the same thing, this rain band complex of primarily convective initiation here and then transitioning to stratiform here. We think we're seeing the same thing in the eyewall actually occurring here. So it suggests, I think this work and also the RAINX work suggests the difference between an eyewall and a rain band. If, you know, it, it, it may not be as strong as we think that uh, sometimes the, the, the eye wall looks a lot like a rain band. Sometimes it looks more like a strong eye wall. Same with the secondary eye wall, right? They're uh, all different variations on the same thing that depend a lot on the dynamics, how the strength of the swirling wind, and the convection, right? The, um, the convective properties. So, um, so if we take uh, a slice through each of these quadrants, so this is um, down shear right, down shear left up shear left, up shear right here. Uh, we get something that looks like this, and it kind of fits this idea of convective initiation in the down shear right quadrant. So we see an elevated convective echo here. You see an updraft. Um, you do see inflow here. So the inflow is actually uh, somewhat deep, um, up to maybe three kilometers, good convergence. But these hydrometeors have not fallen out yet. They're still just growing, right? Here, they're starting to fall out, and um, this is also where we see the strongest low-level convergence. Very strong inflow um, here. See that strong classic convert, convective signature. Um, very sloping outward eyewall here. Um, 
The convection continues to mature as we go up shear left, and you can see that the reflectivity is not quite as strong, but it's still, uh, and it starts to tilt more outward here. Um, you'll notice that there's still low level convection here. You see this beautiful downdraft that was resolved really well by uh, Eldora, right on the inner edge of the eye wall here. Um, if you notice out here though, this looks very stratiform. You've got that mid-level inflow that we talked about before. If you remember from this, the, the rain band picture I showed, you have that mid-level inflow that descends. You actually see something that looks like that. So it looks a lot like that, uh, very much like that rain band picture that we see from, uh, from Henson House and from Barnes et al. 1983. So mid-level inflow, upward motion here, downward motion here, classic sort of stratiform, sort of weaker precipitation. And then as we go up shear right, the convection has continued to decay, and then we see that strat stratiform signal is even more prevalent with that mid-level inflow, um, upward motion here and downward motion here. So what we think we're seeing here is this um, classic convective life cycle initiating down shear right, maturing as it goes around. The hydrometeors fall out as they go, and it uh, goes from a convective, and if we look at that in terms of the divergence profiles, so the down shear, we start at down shear right, that's the green one. We see low level convergence and sort of mid-level divergence, so suggestive of initiation and weak convection. But then here is where the convection is really strong. Uh, strong low level convergence, upper level divergence, classic convective signature. But then the up shear quadrants both show a stratiform signature. Divergence at low levels, mid-level convergence, divergence aloft. Right? So just like what we saw from the Genesis case but in a, now in a mature eyewall. So, so similar type of features. And as I mentioned, there was no, um, it was still very warm core. We, have, we do have some drop saw observations that suggest still have a nice day E maximum in the middle. Um, and then uh, Julian's paper uh, talks about the frontal structure. He does a nice QG analysis and frontal genesis analysis if you're interested in that. Um, but I, I won't have time for that today. Um, I think I have one more slide and then maybe it's time for another break. Um, so I, if you actually look at the uh, re reflectivity, you can also see some evidence of this uh, stratiform and convective uh, separation. So um, this is the mean reflectivity here. See, the down shear right has a lower reflectivity, and then that increases as you go down shear left, um, up shear left, and then starts to decay up shear right. If you look at the variance, um, the variance is also typically used as a measure of convective versus stratiform. So you can see that the variance is the highest um, in the down shear quadrants and lowest in the up shear quadrants, which suggests these are more convective uh, because in the stratiform you tend to see very uh, coherent echoes, very less variance in the, in the radio reflectivity. I think it's really telling though, and this is uh, a bit uh, complicated, but these are uh, contour frequency by altitude diagrams, CFADs of uh, vertical mass flux. So this, uh, on this axis is uh, vertical motion, a zero here. Uh, so this is updrafts on this side, downdrafts on that side. And then the contours are uh, mass weighted um, mass flux units of, uh, I think this is 10 to the fourth kilograms per second. So you can see that if we start um, down to your right, you can see you've got kind of a mix of updrafts and downdrafts at different levels. Um, you see this very strong updraft uh, a strong vertical mass transport here in the down shear left quadrant. You actually see a double peak. We think this is actually due to uh, latent heat of freezing. So you get a little extra bump from freezing above the, free, uh, above the melting level. But very little downdrafts at all in the down, down shear left. Then as we go to the up shear left quadrant, you start to see the predominance of the downdraft. You sort of see a mix of up and down. And then the up shear right quadrant, you see that strong downdraft starting to now this one actually is probably due to the fact that it's not exactly uh, empty here. There's this little convective cell here, so it doesn't fit the per picture perfectly. Uh, so there's still some upward motion here, but, but certainly by and large, we can see that transition up to down as we go around the storm. So, um, so I, 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 she did a really nice job with this analysis. Um, and it, and that actually was, uh, a student of Sarah Jones uh, at, at Germany for this master's work, and she's working with me for a PhD. So um, I helped her with the analysis. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so, yeah, sure. 
how about the uh, how large is the asymmetry of a uh, tangential wing? Mm -hmm. the, we can see there's a large asymmetry in the vertical motion and the reflectivity, but the, in the wind vector, I can see there's some uh, mm -hmm. asymmetric component of a tangential wing. How large is it? Uh, well, in this case, it's pretty big. Uh, so this is um, uh, 45 meter per second here. Yes. Um, so, you know, and this is uh, 37, so I mean about 8 meter per second in terms of the, the, the magnitude of the asymmetry. Um, as I said, I, I don't have a good explanation for why. Um, I mean, certainly you would expect stronger winds in the down shear and left of shear quadrant. So that, this to me is not too surprising, but um, why it's on the, this sort of back side, I don't have a good explanation for, for that. And, um, so I don't, I don't know of a lot of theory on the uh, asymmetry of the tangential wind, other than how it relates to the convection. So where you have more convection, you're gonna stretch the vorticity more and generate a stronger jet. Um, but, uh, but I don't have a good, ex a good explanation for that. So, yeah. uh, I will say that um, Annette, for her PhD, has been working on a thermodynamic retrieval for tropical cyclones. Um, using the radar data, and what we we found is uh, that uh, at least in Hurricane Rita, uh, <coughs> a strong signature of the tilted vortex. So part of what creates this structure is the fact that you take the vortex and you put it in shear and you tilt it down shear, and then it begins to precess. But that precession, um, the 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 invection uh, precession um, balances with the the shear to to form a quasi steady left of tilt shear uh, alignment. And we found that with the thermodynamic retrieval that that, that structure does appear to be uh, valid uh, in the real observations. But um, she's defending in about one month. So um, next time I come, I'll talk about that. <laughs> so. uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. The sim similar comes across, uh, come close to the Japan island. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, relatively higher latitude. I suppose the asymmetry uh, uh, or uh, inhomogeneous distribution of uh, moisture. The uh, northern side is less moist, uh, less moist, and the uh, southern part is uh, more moist. Uh, uh, such an uh, inhomogeneous distribution of moisture could. Uh, uh, has some impact on the asymmetric distribution. Yeah, I agree. Um, we we, uh, we don't. Uh, we tried to look at that a little bit with the drop sons. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of evidence of that, but we weren't able to sample the southern part as much as we wanted. Um, so we don't have a, a great sampling across that. Um, there is some more evidence of that, though, in um, uh, Julian's analysis the next day, where he was really looking more at that thermodynamic structure. I think in the in the eye wall itself, the, the, the air was very moist all the way around, so there was less of an impact on the eye wall. But certainly for the outer vortex, I think that does play a role. So, um, but yeah, we didn't have enough observations of the moisture farther south. So um, the drop sounds were very concentrated around the center of the storm. So yeah, I, I would like to have more. So yeah, if we could have had your aircraft out, we could have it fly south. <laughs> so I believe the DLR, though, I mean, you, the, you flew with the Falcon, maybe maybe there were some other observations that we haven't uh, looked at in, as carefully. We were looking mostly at the C-130 and, and P-3 drop zone. Drop so. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is um, one, uh, five, and eight kilometers. Oh, sorry, this is uh, radar reflectivity, and this is uh, wind speed. So the, the region, uh, just about the red region, the wind speed is weakest. Yes. It, 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 yes. And uh, there are no echo? Um, it's pretty strong echo here, yeah. No, 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 just up. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean. Just up. 
Yeah, it's kind of right, right along the, the maybe the inner edge or so. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that's fair to say. Yes. Yeah, it's it's very interesting that it, it drops off quite quickly here. But this is also, um, yeah, as I mentioned, I think part of it as you go higher is because the the background flow becomes stronger. Um, but I mean, down here it's it's relatively weak, but it gets stronger as you go up. Um, but yes, uh, the the, gra the vertical gradient in the wind is quite strong in that quadrant. I mean, you can see here, you know, the, the, the echoes are still quite strong here, um, going, going up. I mean, the strongest sort of in here, but uh, it's in, in, some impressive convection here. Any other questions? Yeah. Could you show the next slide? More than one more product. So, uh, in this uh, figure, so uh, down to the right, uh, has a uh, large divergence in the middle troposphere. And please show the next slide. So in the uh, yeah. Shifa data, so down here right is a great uh, large uh, uh, down thrust region in the middle troposphere. So, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in a uh, schematic illustration for this uh, for uh, quadrant separation, the down here right is a form formation of the convex region. But the, the uh, the frequency of the uh, high, uh, lower uh, the thrust is not so much. Right. So, is this a little bit shift? Little bit shift for the. Uh, yeah, I yes, I agree. Um, I think part of it is yeah that they um, when we uh, arbitrarily sort of separate it into those yeah. quadrants. Yes, that there's some overlap, right? Um, so I think on average we're going to see these initiations happening there, but then you also see um, some of the older convection, um, and this is something we're looking at with the Rita case. Is you know sometimes uh, if you look at uh, the ground-based loops, you know sometimes you have cells that pop up and they're very strong and they go all the way around, and so you still get some more downdrafts here. So the up shear this quadrant, I mean you're seeing initiation here and and. Uh, and, yeah, and, and decay there. So you're mixing those two together. How do you use the shear vector between the 850 and the 200? It will be the shear vector is more. Yeah, that's true. If you were to use a slightly different shear vector, you might um, you, you might uh, then it would be pointing more like this, yes. and then uh, that that would actually yeah, you might you're right. You might get a better, a slightly better ship separation. So. Well, the other thing we found was that um, you know it depended on which analysis you used. Uh, so if you use ECMWF or, uh, GF or GFS, and uh, you know everybody has a slightly different shear. You know, yes. what, what region, like what radius, to 300 kilometers or 500 kilometers, whether you remove the vortex or not, yeah. you get you get a lot of slight variations yes. in that. So we, we thought this was yeah it's, it's a reasonable approximation, but yeah. it may not fall exactly. But yeah, that's a good point. Sorry, the, the right side. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, it's uh, corresponding to the uh, decay stage of uh, uh, this quadrant. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah that's so, the tail end of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is, I mean, you can kind of think of this as the beginning, uh, continuing, and then this. So this increases to this, then starts to decay. This starts to increase. And then starts to decay. So, so they, they are combined with the uh, uh, decay stage and the uh, formation stage. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Well, then maybe we take one more break and then uh, yes. they will finish it up. Sound good? Yep. Okay. So, how many slides left? Um, let me see. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got a bunch, but I'm gonna, I can skip some stuff because I showed some things. You don't need to skip. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've gone very, much slower today, so. Five uh, minutes. I, I have about 40 slides left, but. Let's start from 40 past 11.
Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, two announcements, and uh, first announcement is is uh, you know Professor Mike Bell uh, kindly uh, accept to you know uh, we uh, you know we can upload his presentation to be our website, and also uh, maybe later on, maybe a week or two weeks later from now, but uh, we upload his presentation today and yesterday, and also I'm sorry. I forgot some code of video cam, <laughs> but um, I recorded his presentation today. Uh, I also upload the you know the movies today, and also uh, one more. Uh, I like to one more thing. You know, uh, since the restaurant becomes crowded from you know twelve to one o'clock, so um, we like to change the schedule slightly. The Kanada san. We'll have a talk after you know Michael Bell's talk. Uh, but, but I wonder if he has another morning slot. So mm. Maybe yeah. It, 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 it might depends on the you know yeah. finishing time of you. But I think yeah. I think uh, twelve o'clock to one o'clock is so crowded. So to to eat some lunch. So okay. Maybe yeah. That's my announcement. Okay. okay. Take take a break. Okay.